I was very impressed that there was that many organizations that can actually talk to each other and work with each other to have an event like this, because I'm an American, I came up from the US, and one of the reasons I did come up from the US is when you get two organizations sitting down together in the US, they're always fighting. It, it, the US, America is so ego-driven, as you might know, that it, it makes it very hard for people to work together. And I love Canada because Canadians do work much better together, and this is one of the evidence that you've just seen of that. So I'm at the hospital for sick children, and the other reason that I'm here is because Sick Kids has a philosophy, whether it's at their research center or at the hospital, of bringing together their fundamental researchers with their clinicians and clinical trialists. So we're all on the same floor. So things could be rapidly translated because somebody, I'll give you an example, a clinical trialist might be sitting and hearing us speak about a finding even before it's published and before you know it, the clinical trial has now been put in for ethics approval and for Health Canada approval. So things can happen very quickly because of the philosophy of the place. Also, because when we go to the cafeteria, we see the kids who are sick, and often we have those kids come back to the lab for lab tours and their families, so it makes our students and trainees realize what they're doing this for. We're doing it for the kids who are sick, and it gives the parents hope because they see what we're doing and that our students are working 12 to 14 hours a day in the lab, um, as I'm sure all you are, just to be able to, to get their research done and to have dramatic findings. So what we have is we're really, we, we have an awareness of why we're there and that even as basic researchers and fundamental researchers, we do have a responsibility to translate and to try to improve the health of children and Canadians. So what I'll talk today about is the translatability of basic research findings. So that's one of my topics, but it's, um, uh, so it's, uh, what I've been asked to talk about here is how do we know that a basic research finding is translatable and what's required to take it to the clinic or to company creation? So I'll talk, uh, take, I've ta chosen some examples of, we've, of how we've started companies with the findings in our lab and also how we've, ta how we've started clinical trials. Um, what are the pathways to the clinic? What are the pathways to commercialization? And what are the pros and cons of going down the translation path? But what I'm really going to be talking about, too, is my experience as a principal investigator and a lab head of all the problems and all the successes we've had in trying to translate. And a lot of you are trainees. And so the patents we have that come out of our lab, our trainees are on the patents, they do it. So what we hope sometimes is that we can make these decisions together with the people in our lab. And sometimes they just want to get a really nice paper. And sometimes, probably about for half my trainees, they really have an interest in going on to translation, either through companies or patent law or, or whatnot. So there is an interest in our lab. We encourage that. You don't have to take an ac academic stream. There are many streams where you can contribute to Canada's well-being and health. So um, uh, my lab is joint with Frieda Miller. So Frieda and I are married, so we're close collaborators. Uh, we have offices next to each other. We have a lab of about um, 15 to 20 trainees at any one time, and we're basic researchers. And our questions usually are, are how do stem cells build and maintain the brain? Uh, that's our, our big interest. Uh, which is brain development. Can we repair the injured and aging brain by w mobilizing or waking up stem cells? So even though we have patents on using stem cells as a therapeutic, what we really want to do is knowing how many places in our body there are stem cells that just aren't working or quiescent or not really, or just sitting there. How can we wake them up to do what they can do? And if we can wake them up, maybe they know what to do better than if we put in a given a stem cell in, in a particular niche, and especially the brain. And as I've gotten older, even though I'm at a kid's hospital, I've become really interested in the aging brain, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And so um, how do stem cells regenerate limbs? If you cut your fingertip off, it regenerates, and that's an amazing thing. One of our students did that. He was opening an oyster and cut his finger off, and all of a sudden, the, the fingertip regenerated. So how do stem cells do that? And we do that as a prelude to try to figure out, you know, maybe we can regenerate limbs. So basically, there's stem cells in our limbs that are the conductors of the orchestra, and they tell this stem cell to make a nail and this one to make a bone. So we become interested in that. And also, can we find new treatments for stem cell-based nervous system cancers? So I'll talk about that in the beginning, because I'm both a cancer researcher as well as a neurobiologist and stem cell researcher. So. Um, that's all our basic research leads to translational questions. And so can we identify drugs that can kill cancer cells? So that was my first one as a cancer researcher. 
promote endogenous stem cell mobilization for repair, and prevent axon degeneration. So this is an example of one of the drugs we have. I think the pointer is not really working. One of the drugs we have, yeah, that's here, actually, it's working. And this is a drug we put on to uh, degenerating axon, to, um, to, and it's actually repaired those axons. So we can do this both in culture and in vitro, so that's one example. But I'll talk about a number of the others where we've looked for drugs and identified ones that will target uh, cancer stem cells, that will repair the brain for cognition. I'll talk about a clinical trials for that. I'll talk about a company we formed where we want to work up, want to wake up stem cells in the skin for things like wound healing. And so I'll talk about a number of these examples, some which are commercial and some which have led for clinical trials really supported by charities and by foundations. So there's three paths that we've recognized that we work on. And the first is funding by government and private foundations. So we have funding from a lot of the organizations that you saw there, OIRM and Stem Cell Network and Medicine by Design, that um, government can fund research that can lead to translation. Private foundations and charities often help fund our work because they're par often parent or patient driven. Uh, but we've also gone company creation by venture capital and company creation by angel investors. Angel investors is, in one case, we had a movie producer who heard about, oh, we can grow hair with drugs, and he said, I want to fund that in your lab because people in Los Angeles don't go for coffee. They go for Botox, and they go for Rogaine treatments, and so if you have something that grows hair, we love it. So that's an angel investor. That's not a venture capitalist. And so we've gone through all of these different routes in order to try to translate our findings. We we'll try anything, and we have tried a lot of these different routes. So the first one is what's the bar for translation? I'll talk about cancer research first. So there is no bar for one bar. It turns out for cancer research in kids, it's one bar for adults and another. If it's a cancer where somebody's gonna die in a year, the bar is different than if it's a cancer where there's a low death rate, for example, a low mortality rate. Um, if it's a cosmetic application, grow hair, the bar is infinitely small. They call it whiff of success. You can grow one more hair and you can get a company. So all the bars are different depending on the indication. Um, the bar is different for cancer because it's easy to do clinical trials, much more easy than in the neurological area, which is the other area where again, try to get a stroke trial started or an Alzheimer's trial is very expensive and very difficult compared to a cancer trial. So I'll talk about this first, but the cancer trials, there's, uh, we actually know in cancer too what that bar is. So if you have a drug, for example, it has to, on primary cells in the patients, it has to kill them. Um, if it's, and it can kill the normal cells, so that's part of our drug screens. You have to have preclinical models. They can be a transgenic model or a xenograph where you put the patient cells into the mouse and you see if that mouse gets the human cancer equivalent, and then you put a drug on and try to cure the mouse. You need some kind of evidence that the drug isn't toxic, that it has good pharmacokinetics, that if you're looking at for brain tumors, it can get into the brain. And you really have to know something about the target because you need to do pharmacodynamics. If you put a drug in a patient, you need some way to know that the drug has gotten to the right cell, it's targeting that particular cell, and it's suppressing, say, an oncogenic protein. So for repurposed drugs that have a known safety profile, so we do two types of screens. We look for new drugs, which companies love. They can make a lot of money. But for us, repurposing or repositioning drugs that are already in use for other indication and known to be safe in man, but they're used for, I don't know, some kind of you know, treating a neurological problem, maybe we can show that if they have activity on our cancer cells, the pathway can, can, to the clinic can be very short. And I'll show you an example of that. Because foundations and parents are often asking, well, we're gonna give you all this money, how come we don't see a cure yet? And so we can give them a path that's months, or if it's a new drug, it's gonna take a long time, and I'll show you an example of that. New drugs are what companies are interested in, they can make more money, these off-patent repurposed drugs, they can't. So for new chemical entities, the pathway can become many years, and I'll talk about one of those, and for repurposed drugs, they can be short. But government and charities, as I said, want it to be short. So all our grants from these agencies are one to five years. If we wanted to make a new drug or new device, how can we possibly do that in five years from start? And that's what the Canadian government and all of the organizations fund. They don't fund 10-year grants, they fund 
grants. Our OIRM grants are one year. So what that tells us is that we can't do anything new and novel. We really have to try to do this particular strategy because that's the only thing that will get us into a clinical trial, which is what the funders and the parents want quickly. So I'm going to give you one example of neuroblastoma. So I work on this kid's cancer. It's a nervous system cancer that presents in the, it's, it's a, one of sympathetic uh, ganglia stem, sympathetic stem cells and sympathetic nervous system. Kids can present with little tumors in the face because neural crest stem cells build the, the, the craniofacial bone, some of them, so these kids might have, um, they, they might have orbital tumors. They often will metastasize all over their body. These are neural crest stem cells that have become cancerous, so they're really bad. This is just black, is, is showing the dissemination of this tumor in these children. And, they often go to the bone marrow. It's almost like a leukemia. These are nervous system cells in the bone marrow, and they'll just take over the bone marrow. And when children present, about half of them, they present with these metastases, and 90% of them will succumb. So there's really no treatment. So for us, it's let's try to find drugs that will target these cells. Can we isolate these cells from kids and look for new drugs? So we started. We, we like being a little mini drug company in our, in our lab. We will often take normal or tumor cells and we plate them into dishes and we take repurposed libraries. So we have all sorts of libraries of things in our medicine cabinet that are safe in, in kids and in people. In Mount Sinai, we did um, a lot of drug screening and we put together a team of clinicians, of pharmacologists that can actually help us bring things to the clinic. So it's not a, a good enough to have a drug. What you have to have is to know that drug is stable. It's not going to interfere with other chemotherapeutic drugs. It's safe in kids. If we want it to get into the brain mets, OICR, enormous help in telling us, yeah, this will cross the blood-brain barrier. We'll test this for you and show you that it, that it does. Um, we have clinicians. Meredith is a clinician researcher I have joint labs with, a uh, joint lab and student with. And so what Meredith does is she sees all the patients for the neuroblastoma at sick kids. So it really makes it easy for us to say, here's a patient. Let's get their cells and screen them. We have a specialist of sick kids in clinical trials. And we have not just the stem cell network, but different charities who've raised about five million for us over the years. So if there's a clinical trial ready to go, these parent-driven charities, this one in New York City and this one in Peterborough, have really helped us in getting these trials started. And so this is an example of where the bar is for kids' cancer. So this is taking a, a mouse which has a tumor from a patient, and we gave them vinblastine, that's a frontline chemotherapeutic, rapamycin, which a lot of people know, which is um, used for organ rejection, or this is just the control tumor. So what we're looking at is the tumor weighed after uh, several months. And what we can show is that rapamycin was very effective at shrinking, at keeping this tumor from growing. Essentially, it, it shrunk the tumor quite well. This data was enough that because there's a safety profile in kids that was fine, that Sylvain Varachel, when he saw this data, immediately went for ethics approval and health Canada approval and was able to start within months accruing patients for clinical trials. All we needed was this data in order to take that to the clinic and for him to get this going. That's an advantage of kids because this is a cancer where in the group we were looking at, 90% of those kids will die. We need anything and rapamycin is a relatively safe drug has side effects, but not for a child who's dying to be able to get this going. So um, how do we do with this? We, we published it, so the postdoc got a, a nice publication. Um, then we completed a successful phase one trial with and without vinblastine, the frontline chemotherapeutic. Um, charities funded this clinical trial. It was a, a grant that we submitted to this charity, and they said, great to do this. Um, this was done four sites in Canada, one in the U.S. by Sylvain, and it was advanced for consideration. But development stalled because it's off-patent drug. No company was there to do the phase two trial. So at least it told us that rapamycin and mTOR regulators would, might be really good for treating this cancer, and that might have gotten other companies interested, which they have, but not in rapamycin. But the advantages of this approach is with a safety profile, we can get this going really quickly, and for kids, there's something called a rule of five. You can do a clinical study, five patients dosed at five sites in a clinical safety trial as soon as that animal preclinical data is in, ethics approval, Health Canada approval, 
25 kids could be tested, that told the safety and preliminary efficacy, which we can't really report in a phase one, but we were able to at least see whether this is going to be okay with kids, and some of the kids did tend to respond. The disadvantage, though, it's an off-patent drug, so there's no commercialization potential. So funding was all from private charities, and we really couldn't find anybody to do the much more expensive, so that was about 250,000 for that phase one, but phase twos and phase threes might be 10 times that price. Who's gonna fund that? So development really stalled, although at least we got it this far and got the attention of companies who have things like rapamycin. So knowing that, we decided, okay, we'll take another tact. OICR had created a library of kinase inhibitors. 110 of them which are in use by companies for adult cancers or approved. So we took this library and screened our cells. And one of them was a drug, it's called a polo-like kinase 1 inhibitor, which worked really well in culture, but especially in mice. So this is a mouse, and we're looking at the tumor volume over time. We've treated three times with this drug, and we're looking at how the tumor growth. So the tumor, as those are three doses of the drug, and then we just let it sit. So as long as that mouse was dosed, we saw no tumor growth. We looked at survival curves, and the mice survived a lot better, even though we only gave three doses of the drug. Then vehicle-treated mice, so this looked pretty good. Now, this is a drug owned by Boringer Engelheim, because the problem is the market for drugs for can kids with cancer is small, so we only see 25 kids with neuroblastoma each year at sick kids. It's not really profitable. But the solution, I thought, if the drug works in adult cancer, maybe we can convince companies and born to Ingelheim, Canada, had meetings with us because they have this drug in clinical trials for adult cancers, and they ended up initiating clinical trans, they were gonna do it in Canada, but they decided to do it in their home territory of Germany using this drug for pediatric tumors, and we also got an American company interested to initiate their own PLK1 inhibitor trial at sick kids, and they're about to do it, and then they went under, which is what happens with a lot of these small companies. But nevertheless, that's been one of our strategies. Use somebody else's drug drug, get them interested, and we were lucky there was a pediatric oncologist at the time in Borger, Ingelheim, Canada, who thought, look, we really have to push this for kids' tumors, even though our main market's going to be adult cancer. So that's another strategy. Again, that was our bar. The drug looked pretty good, didn't cure the mice, but there's only three doses of it. But that was enough to get a company to actually start a clinical trial, so we were proud of that. So we also at the same time had started a brain tumor program. And the reason we've been doing this, and there's a lot of prominent people who've had these types of tumors recently, we wanted to really, this is uh, medium survival is only 15 months. Uh, brain tumors are really resistant to almost all chemotherapeutic, uh, chemotherapies. They're all very different, even the cells within the tumors, Peter Dirk's set. At uh, Sick Kids has been one of the pioneers of this, including discovering with Sheila Singh at McMaster uh, cancer stem cells in this tumor, high mutation rates. It's hard to get the drug into the brain. There's a lot of brain toxicity. So we thought, what's our solution to this? We created a cross Canada team to discover effective new drugs for glioblastoma. It was funded by Terry Fox on the Stem Cell Network. Um, this is for screening drugs from patients. 30 patients where we thought we'd cover the heterogeneity with the goal to bring new drugs to clinical trials within five years. So we we're going to really mobilize what's best in Canada, throughout Canada, to be able to get our own little drug, academic drug company. And so this was a project which Terry Fox liked because they gave us eight million for the five years. And we put together different cores in different parts of the country depending on their strengths. So we found a preclinical core in Calgary, I guess to give you an example of our little Canadian thing here, um, that Sam Weiss had all these cell lines, so he, in Calgary, Sheila Singh knows how to isolate cancer stem cells, I do all the screening here, my lab, um, medicinal chemistry, Remal Arwar has been key in all our, our, all our efforts. The preclinical core, which had all the mice was at, um, to test, was at Calgary and Vancouver. They sequenced all these lines. We do fossil proteomics on them. And then we had a clinical development lead, Warren Mason, a Princess Margaret, who has the NCIC clinical trials group for brain tumors. So we felt we got the best people in the country together to answer that question, can we find new drugs for brain tumors? And so we have a profile that we wanted. So we want drugs that kill every brain tumor cell, but no normal cells from patients. We don't want to stop them growing. We want to kill those guys. 
We, the drugs have to penetrate the brain. It has to last, so they can't, a lot of, some drugs get into the brain, but get pumped right back out. It has to be sell it safe and well tolerated, and it has to work in mice. So we had a pretty high bar in getting these to work. So what was our results? Because the project just ended. We screened 1,500 drugs, all sorts of different libraries on 20 primary lines from patients. We had multiple hits, we went down to 50 compounds. We prioritized that, and that's by potency, novelty, whether it got into the brain, um, how well it was hitting the target. 14 of these were tested in extensive preclinical models. None of them worked. So that's a problem. We had a hypothesis that if we take primary cancer stem cells from patients, that if those cells, when we put them into mice, and we give them drugs, when those mice have a brain tumor, we put them right into the brain, they grow a brain tumor. None of those drugs worked as single agents, all of them worked on the cells. It told us those cell models aren't predictive, so that's unfortunate, that was our whole hypothesis, that if we switch to primary cells from the patient, that maybe we can get things that will work in mice that we can then get into the clinic. But four of them potentiated a frontline therapy called temozolomide in patients. They made temozolomide work a lot better. Uh, companies, as a result, we have lots of company collaborations, but can we further those development or pr proceed to clinical trials? And so what we found is even though these drugs were as good as anything out there for brain tumors, the companies were interested, but they said, well, you know, it has to work in mice and you have to do a lot more, and we're fine if you work for free for us. So we'll give you some of our drugs and please test them, but we really didn't get any money. We ended up working for drug companies on their drugs versions of what we had found. And so that was our first issue, but that was okay. We had eight million in funding. But what we were really surprised at is when we presented our findings to the clinical trial groups, even though our drugs were better than everything that was out there or as good, those clinical trialists said, unless you can get somebody who will guarantee funding for phase one, phase two, and phase three, that's like 10 million or more, we don't want to test your drug in patients. We're not going to bring it to the clinical trials. So we have safe drugs, drugs that are potentiating and extending the lifespan of mice in combination with temozolomide, but they wanted a company to sponsor all of those trials, and we're working on repurposed drugs, largely. So we can get phase one funded, that's a couple hundred thousand, but we couldn't come up with 10 million. We saw companies that were getting their drugs into the clinic with almost no preclinical data because they said, fine, we'll just fund it. And these are companies that might have a drug for colon cancer in clinical trials. And they said, well, let's just try brain even though we don't have data, if they're willing to fund it. So that was depressing for us. So we decided to take another tack because we always keep trying. And so we have a drug that seemed to be working with temozolomide. It's called disulfiram. So alcoholics take it. If they take a drink, they get sick. Disulfiram makes them sick. And it's really good. There's a very small amounts of it can kill all our primary cells. This is a percent survival when we're putting the drug on. And for mice, with TMZ, it was extending their life. Uh, this is days after implantation, percent survival, and this is what you usually see in the brain tumor field. It, it's hard to, you never cure, but if you could extend life, that's good. So temozolomide and the drug alone was like that, and with temozolomide, it was like this. Even though it was off patent and very inexpensive and safe, what Greg Cancross, who was the head of our grant, and Steve Robbins, who's part of the grant, people might know him because he's head of the Institute of Cancer Research at CHR, decided to beat the bushes. And what they, people liked the data so much, there was a disulfiram trial on. They, they put our combination of disulfiram, it turns out it works really good with copper, um, into, a newly, into a GBM trial with Wash U in the States, and also in a new trial in Brazil, where they want cheap and safe drugs. So what they were able to do is convince people to put disulfiram onto clinical trials that were either related or new trials in places that really appreciate safe and treat drugs. So even though we couldn't get any of our drugs into the clinic, this one did go into the clinic, mostly because Greg and Steve really worked hard to convince different people that this is a good drug. And you have to know your market. So, can we set the bar for clinicians and companies? So what we really want to do is go to a company and say, this is what you need to get things to the clinic. This is the preclinical data. So we sponsored a workshop with all of the neuroblastoma researchers in the world in the field where we start to answer question, how well should the target of the drug be validated? 
how many lines should be tested from patients, and we should con consider drugs only that kill all the lines. How many models should be used? So there's orthotopic models where you put the tumor into the brain if it's a brain tumor, xenografts, you put it into the side of a mouse, there's genetic models, there's metastatic models. And should we only consider drugs that cure the mice, not just extend their lifespan? And should we consider drugs only if the biomarkers have been developed? Because if you want to know if your drug's working in a patient, you really need a biomarker to know that your drug is on target and suppressing the, the target of that drug. So all of these we've made decisions on. There's a valuation package that's being written, and I think it's probably already written, that if a company comes to us, we'll say, this is the criteria in this particular field that we've used. Yes, we need these genetic models. Yes, we need the mouse to show that it's been cured of neuroblastoma, not just its lifespan expended. And we have biomarkers. So how has our academic cancer drug discovery ever been fruitful? So would we do it again, and what would we do differently? So we've established cross-Canada teams. We have a number of phase one trials completed, and we have lots of papers, which makes the trainees happy. Um, and 18 of our trainees, since I've started my lab about 20 years ago, and it's since 25 years ago, have gotten jobs in industry. That's good for the people in the lab. They've been working on these translational proje projects. Um, there, but, and we found out that our cancer stem cells and primary cells aren't really predictive of whether they work in mice, so we've now developed better preclinical models. So the issues is we've had to rely on repurposing rather than new chemical ent entities. Um, that's a problem path for companies for repurposed drugs. Funding agencies want results in three to five years, which is why we've done this. Um, and they rather, all the funding agencies want a clinical and commercialization outcome. That's what people want. Or the, or the they, stem cell network likes commercialization rather than academic achievement. But there's a problem, which I'll talk about at the end again. We're not judged on whether we make a company or whether I have a clinical trial. When I go up for assessment at SickKids, it's my grants and my papers and how well have my students done. It's my patents don't count. If I form a company, it doesn't count. That's a problem because these are very time intensive to do. So institutions in Canada, except maybe Waterloo and a few others, really don't judge us if we're in the biomedical field on our commercialization and translational achievements. They judge us on our academic achievements. So we really like to try to partner with companies upfront that can commit to funding a clinical path. And you really have to decide, is it worthwhile doing this, or else you have to educate your university or institution to say, if I spend 20% of my time on a company or, or starting a clinical trial, you have to give me credit for that, because it might not result in a publication. So just for the last few minutes, I want to talk about some success stories. So this is one where we've used co commercialization creation and clinical trials for some other things, and I'll talk about these particular two. One is for drugs for, rep for repair and cognition, and another one for wound healing. But first, I just want to talk about a company that we started when we were at McGill. And this is one where we didn't have anything in the lab. The Canadian Medical Discoveries Fund, a venture capital uh, fund, approached a number of academic scientists to set up companies. And I said, I don't want to set up a company. And they said, we'll give you half a million dollars for your lab. And I said, oh, I'll set up 10 companies. Just keep it coming. So a bunch of us got together and formed a company called Ajira. And the indications were cancer. Um, we had IP for this particular family of modulators. That's important in cancer. Neurodegeneration, which is what Frida Miller and Phil Barker and I were working on. And novel stem cell sources, which Frida had discovered in the skin. We started with $3 million investment, we raised $100 million, we had 40 employees, um, five new drugs, over 15 phase one and two clinical trials for cancer and diabetic neuropathy. So we were pretty, going pretty strong and had developed quite the biotech company. So one of the problems is that the outcomes are all 15 clinical trials failed. So that's life, that happens, and the company was sold for three million, remember we raised 100 million, it's now a division of that particular company. And another outcome here is that even though, since we were basic researchers, they only wanted us around for three or four years. Once clinical trials started, they actually took all the founders off the website, they never heard from us again, uh, they didn't want to hear from us because they were a clinical trials company, and that was fine. Companies have to evolve, but our involvement was really the first few years. But the benefit is in return, the company provided a lot of reagents to us. So we were making all sorts of viral vectors at the time, they made them for us. 
many hundreds of thousands of dollars of reagents the company helped us with rather than providing money to the lab. But that saved us a lot of money when CHR grants were, were low, or they still are low. And many of our trainees obtained company experience because the company was across the street from our labs at McGill, and we had them work there. They saw what a milestone was, they saw what companies do, they put it on their CV and it helped them get jobs in industry throughout the world and Canada. So overall, that was a really positive experience, even though the company was sold for three million and what I have from the company is a refrigerator magnet and a t-shirt and a mug that says Ajira. I really didn't get any monetary benefit from it, but it was a good experience nonetheless and clinical trials can fail. So there's another company which we just formed, and so it's a stem cell mobilization company. And the rationale that Frida and I have is discovering safe drugs that could be repurposed to mobilize endogenous stem cells might be easier from a regulatory and cost standpoint for commercialization than stem cell transplantation, even though we're also interested in that, and we have patents for this too. So what I love to do is drug screening. I love drugs. And so we screen Frida's human dermal stem cells. This, you can get these from breast reduction surgeries or from uh, circumcisions. So this is a team grant funded by the Stem Cell Network to us. And so the indications are burns and blisters, diabetic ulcers, burns from radiation treatments, alopecia, so hair loss types of things. So we're looking for drugs that can take these dermal stem cells, accelerate wound healing. And Frida had had a number of papers on the discovery of these uh, dermal stem cells. So what do we do? We took these cells and we just added them in a dish and we added all sorts of drugs for repurposing, and we looked in mouse models, can they grow hair, can they make skin look luxurious and nice again, can they heal wounds? So we did those types of assays, so all our cancer researchers and neurobiologists are busy testing these drugs for hair growth. And for example, they, what they have to do is wax the mice, and these are two drugs that we had, and so what we're just showing in this particular case is um, in this case, this is uh, Brooke Shields, who has a drug called Latisse, which is a glaucoma drug that happened to make long eyelashes, and so that's our gold standard. And we have drugs that seem to work just as well. So we have other drugs that increase skin thickness. They're only on, here, on the skin for about a week in mice. And wound healing, we published this work. We had ones that really accelerated wound healing, and that's just showing here. Healing was much faster in nine days with some of these drugs on than control. The, the wound width and epithelial gap was much less, so that told us that these were working in wound healing. And this was all funded by an angel investor through a sponsored research agreement with sick kids. So we're all sitting there going, oh, is Nair better or waxing the mice or what's sort of better in, in when we're looking at these hair growth assays? But nonetheless, the way these were working is they were stimulating and mobilizing the cells in the skin to make hair better, repair the skin, and make wounds better. So Reveille was a company by that person who, who, that angel investor, as well as others, which was just established using the IP, the patents of our drugs that endogenously mobilize stem cells. So we're the founders, there's angel investors and sick kids on part of the company. And the focus is clinical trials for therapeutic skin and hair growth indications. And the advantage is the bar is really low. So as I said, you grow a couple hair and anybody will like buy the thing. You know, I, all my relatives are lining up anyway to use some of these drugs. They're already used topically for other indications. If you want to make skin that age as much, really low bar. So these are topical, they're safe, they're inexpensive. Trials could be started for a few hundred thousand and, and getting these into the clinic is relatively quick. So I'm gonna give you one last path, which we're really excited about, and this comes out of basic research findings. So it's another path to the clinic, which was based on findings in a number of papers from our labs that metformin, which is the diabetic drug, acts on several pathways to wake up. It's a cup of coffee for the stem cells in the brain. It makes them self-renew, and it makes them make neurons and white matter better. So it's kind of like your stem cells are sitting there sleeping, and that's, metformin's an alarm clock, wakes them up and makes them work better. And what Jing found with Paul Franklin's lab is she gave mice metformin, and it made them a lot smarter. It improved their cognition. And I don't know if that mouse is that smart. It looks like it's cheating. But in all cases, every time we gave these mice metformin, it made them smarter. So Don Mabbitt, one of our neuropsychologists, was listening to Frida talk about that before the paper was published, the Stel Semtel paper was published. And he said, I'm getting into the trial because I have an ideal indication. So he was able to start a phase three trial, because metformin's safe in kids, 
using metformin, cheap and safe, to improve cognition in ch children with acquired brain injury. What brain injury? He works on kids that when, you get med when they get med medulloblastoma, they have radiation treatment. 97% of them will have learning and memory problems. And so all of them will have problems getting a job, have problems in school, live in their parents' basement, although my teenage kids were fine and they lived in our basement too after university. But in this case, he has a whole cohort of kids who have learning problems. So the trial is to assess metformin and learning, and he does imaging. Uh, he's a neuroimager, so he's looking at hippocampal volume and myelination. And it's based on the possible hypothesis that if we can stimulate neural stem cells, it will enhance learning and memory after injury. It's funded by the Cancer Center at Sick Kids as well as 3DB, which is a charity. And we have, if this works, we have two other trials lined up, one for optic neuritis, which is a white matter um, damaging disease of kids, which causes blindness, and cerebral palsy trials also, because it was a cerebral palsy charity. So, and if you can imagine, if metformin really increases learning and memory, all of us in the room will probably take it. Already diabetics who take metformin and insulin versus other drugs and insulin have half the amount of, of dementia than the ones who just, who don't take metformin. So metformin is already in clinical trials for, Alzheimer, for Alzheimer's disease. But this is telling us that because of the mechanism, it might be waking up those endogenous stem cells. And Don will be able to prove that and we'll know hopefully by December the results of this phase three trial. That was an enormous success, because, but again, funded by charities, no company cares about metformin. Um, and metformin works better than anything that other companies have for whatever reason, but this is a penny of drug. It's taken by people five years old to 95 years old, and it's perfectly safe. So the lessons learned, just in summing up, so it's um, basic research. It, it really needs to be translated, so that's my view, to encourage government and the public to continue supporting fundamental and basic research finding. And in our case, from our basic research findings, we created two companies, lots of team grants, which all which includes clinicians and basic researchers. In the past five years, we've completed or in progress for clinical trials, and 18 of our trainees now have gone on to companies, which is what I'm most proud about, because we've trained a whole cohort of, of of trainees who, who really know how to do translational research hopefully better than I can. The bad is, as I said, little credit for starting up companies or patents by the university, yet it's a huge time commitment and pressure to do translational research. Every university wants commercialization, but you get no credit for doing it. Um, you have to know your motivation. Is it funds for the lab? Is it funds for yourself? Is it societal benefit? So if we have a hair growth company, is that really a societal benefit versus a new stroke drug, a neurodegeneration, a diabetic neuropathy drug? That's your call. For this new company, because of the rules at my institution, I have to be, even though I'm the founder, it's all my IP that's gone to the company, my drugs, the rules say I can't own any equity. So I'm working for that company for free. It's owned partially by sick kids and by investors who want to make money. Is that fair? Because I have to spend a lot of time. Educate your institution. Um, funders and investors want immediate results, as I keep talking about. Ajira took 10 years to develop their drugs and get them into the, uh, get them into the clinic. Because if any of those clinical trials work, this would have been a billion dollar company. But the funders and investors and parents and patients want immediate results. So what we have to always decide is do we go for a new drug or repurposing? And as you know, investment capital is scarce in Canada, although new mechanisms, some of them sponsoring this meeting, are, are really starting to help that to find us the investors we need. So just the people who did the work, and this is not to say we only hire women, but maybe that's what happens. Um, Natalie, Kristen, Sybil, and Marilyn, especially Kristen, started all the drug screening in my lab. Natalie did all the cancer drug screening. Sybil, who's now at OBI, Kristen is now head of screening at a company in San Diego. Natalie at Fusion and at McMaster. Um, Marilyn, L'Oreal approached us for a research contract because they knew we can grow hair and make skin look better, and instead they just hired Mary Lynn because she's French, and so they decided not to have a research contract with us because they got what they needed. That's okay, she got to go back to France. But all of them have gotten jobs in industry. Um, Jing is now an assistant professor in Ottawa. She started all the metformin work. Great clinical trialists who work with our basic research groups, and special thanks to OICR and Rima Alarwar and David Euling. So, if you want to do drug discovery, you need medicinal chemists, you need drug discovery, you need people who know what drugs are. 
and Rima is an integral part of all of our groups um, for whatever indication. She helps us know what the drugs are. Are they going to be safe in humans? Do they get into the right place? So she's always been part of our group. So all of these, as you can tell, we need different expertises. We need different skills in order to get our drugs to the clinic. So thanks.